Hello everyone and welcome to WASP 101. I'm Andrea Rossi, the developer of WASP. This series of tutorials is taught to introduce you to uh, using WASP as a tool to model discrete aggregations in Grasshopper. I'm gonna go through uh, the basics of using WASP for this task as well as try to show you some of the more hidden features that may not be super intuitive from uh, just looking at the example files. For the one of you who don't know what WASP is, WASP is a small plugin uh, that can be added to the Grasshopper parametric modeling environment to allow it to uh, model discrete aggregations. Uh. So what WASP really allows to is to define simple repetitive geometries as well as connectivity rules and connectivity location on the faces of its geometry and use this as an iterative assembly uh, algorithm to combine these parts into a um, complete aggregation. There are a variety of ways to control this to control this approach and once these rules are defined it becomes possible to generate large-scale aggregations. Uh, very fast. So as you can see here from some of these some examples uh, from students from different courses that I've been teaching based on WASP, uh, once the rules and the parts are defined, it's WASP can very quickly generate extremely large aggregations and it also takes care of checking a whole set of things such as collisions, the fact that parts do not overlap, as well as the coherence with the uh, originally defined assembly uh, grammar. So a little bit of history, WASP started to be developed around three years ago as part of my PhD thesis at the uh, Digital Design Unit at TU Darmstadt and since around three years it's available uh, to download on Food for Rhino as well as uh, as an open source package that you can find on GitHub too. In this first tutorial we are gonna be uh, looking at the bare minimum components you need to generate an aggregation in WASP. We are gonna be generating what's called a stochastic aggregation which means we are gonna generate an aggregation where the only uh, elements we are gonna define are the rule connecting the different parts and uh, then we are gonna let a random algorithm select how to put these parts together to generate the structure. So we are gonna create a aggregation composed of uh, only one part and this part is going to be a um, hexagonal prism which we are going to model in Rhino. To start modeling this in Rhino we are going to start by drawing a polygon and to do that we are going to be typing polygon in the Rhino bar and once you enter the polygon uh, menu you can choose you can make sure that the number of sides is set to 6 as we want to create an hexagon. If it's not, you can click here and just type 6 and press enter. And then we want to create a, a hexagon centered on the origin. And to achieve that, we can just type on the keyboard 0 and press enter. Now we have an hexagon which is centered around the origin. And we want to specify that we want a, a edge of 10. So to achieve that, we type 10 and press enter. And now what we want to do is we want to keep shift pressed and, pr and click along the x-axis to keep the vertices aligned with it. Here, here you go. Now we have our hexagon and we want to create out of this hexagon uh, uh, an hexagonal prism with square faces. So we select our uh, hexagon and type uh, extrude curve to extrude this. Make sure that both sides are is set to no and solid is set to yes. Type 10 and press enter. Now we generated our uh, basic prism. We can switch our view to a ghosted view in order to be able to see uh, the geometry shaded with some transparency. And now that we define the geometry of our part, the second step uh, that we saw in the slides before is that we need to define the location where uh, this part can connect to other parts. To do that, we can uh, get a, pen, uh, a point from the Rhino toolbar and we want to create a point in this exact middle of the face. To do that, we make sure that the snaps are selected and the mid snap is active and we are going to click while keeping control pressed on the mid edge of, the, of our prism. And so this brings us into vertical mode. So we are snapping to the uh, 
mid edge, but we are moving vertically. And we want to then go and click on the middle of the vertical edge in order to create a point in the exact middle of the face. After defining this point, we need to define the direction of uh, our connection. To do that, we just go select a line, click on our uh, midpoint, and then click on the mid of the top edge. This creates a line that will define how to orient the plane that will be used to connect to the to another part. This is very important. Is what's very important is to draw this line uh, in the correct orientation, meaning from the center point outwards, because this is going to define the orientation. If you would draw the line in the opposite orientation, meaning from the top edge down to the center point, you will actually create a connection that is rotated 180 degrees around its z-axis. Good. We created our first connection, and now we want to create two more. We are not going to create connections on all faces, but we are going to do it on alternating faces. We did the first face here, we skip the second, and we now do one on the third one. We get again a point, we go on the mid edge, press control, click while pressing control, move up, and snap to the mid edge. And this time, instead of drawing a connection that is oriented to the top, we are going to draw a connection that is oriented to the side. This will cause the parts to rotate around each other and create a fully spatial 3D aggregation. So we click at the center point and we click on the mid of the vertical edge. We are going to then go, we are going to then skip one more face and then go to the last face and again get a point, mid edge, pressing control, click and click snapping to the mid of the vertical edge. And this time again let's choose uh, let's start from our midpoint and let's choose another orientation. In this case, I'm going to go do it downwards. Great. We did everything we need to do in Rhino to define our part. And now it's time to move into Grasshopper and Wasp and start generating our Wasp parts to build our structure. So the first step to do that we have to do is we need to import all the geometry. The first part the first element to import is the geometry of the part and for that we can just use a geometry component. We bring it in, we right click, set one geometry and select our uh, prism. Now that our prism is selected we can click on it in Rhino and by pressing this grey bu light bulb we can hide it. So we don't need to, uh, it doesn't disturb us while we draw the rest. Next, we have to import our points and our lines. And one thing that is very important is to allow WASP to compute the connection correctly is that point and lines have to be imported in the same order. We are going to start with the points, bringing a point component. And as we have more than one point, this time we are going to right click and select set multiple points. We're going to click on the first point, on the second point, and on the third point, and then right click to accept. And now we have our three point points important. Now, in this case, it's quite simple because we just have three points. And so you should be able to remember uh, the order. However, when you're going to start working with more complex parts, sometimes it might become difficult to remember the exact order. To, uh, uh, to solve this problem, we can use um, a component that is called point list. Right click and look for it. So point list, here you go. And what this component does is we can simply plug um, our points in it and then specify a size for the text to display. And let's specify a size of two. And what we have here automatically is we have our three points displayed with a number that shows the order of the points in the list. Through this, now we can know exactly that order and select our curves in the same exact order. To select our curves, we bring a curve component. We right click, set multiple curves, and we follow the same order that is specified by the point list component. Here we go. Now we have everything we need to uh, build our WASP 
parts. So we're gonna go to the parts menu of WASP and we're gonna get a basic part. We're gonna see in further tutorials what, a, what an advanced part is and what's useful for, but for now let's stick to the basics. And so once we bring our WASP part components, we have to specify uh, some data to have it generate. The first thing we have to specify is a name, which is the way in which WASP will recognize these parts and will allow us to define rules to connect one part to the other parts. To assign the name, we can use a panel where we write the name of the part. The quickest way to generate a panel in Grasshopper is to double click on the, on the canvas and then uh, type an inverted comma and then after the inverted comma we can type uh, anything we want to be in that panel. In this case I'm gonna call this part EXA. So here we go and we connect this. One uh, note, something you should be really careful, uh, WASP is case sensitive so it's important that the way you write this name is uh, consistent across uh, all components of WASP. If you type it here with all caps and in somewhere else not with caps, WASP will not be able to automatically recognize this. Now that we have our name defined, the second component that we have uh, in input is a geometry and the geometry is our geometry. Uh, WASP, WASP, WASP works with meshes and uh, our component is a uh, BREP, but for now to have it simple we can just go with the automatic conversion that Grasshopper does when we input our BREP. And the third input which is very important is uh, the connection. So where can this part connect to other parts? To generate a connection we can go to the elements tab and select WASP connection from direction. So here we need three inputs. So we need the geometry, which is the geometry of our element. We need the center points of our connections and we need the directions of our connections. And now you see that we have automatically generated uh, three connections, one for each of them. And you can also see that um, a plane is displayed which is aligned with the face and has the x-axis which aligns with the line we provided. That's all we need. We can take then the connections and connect them into the connection element and now we can see that uh, our part component uh, is created. So you can take a look here again. This is the very basic bare minimum that you will need to generate any WASP part. We are going to see further on how to use the other inputs to do more advanced things, but this is the very, very minimum you need to define a WASP part. Now let's continue and let's start creating an aggregation. To create an aggregation, we want to go to the aggregation tab and we want to pick, as we said, a stochastic aggregation. The stochastic aggregation is an aggregation that will not um, follow any driving geometry or any driving fields as other aggregations do, but will simply randomly pick at every step a part and add it to the aggregation in a random location. So while that's, this is not necessarily the more advanced or more effective way to generate an aggregation, is definitely the easiest and for this reason is uh, one that we can use to quickly test an aggregation and see what are the different outputs when you use different rules or when you change the parts. We have our aggregation and the first input that our aggregation has is of course what kind of parts we want to use for this aggregation. In this case we said we, want, we are creating a very simple aggregation with just one part so we are simply plugging our hexagonal part to the part input. We are going to ignore the previous input for now and the next input we are going to look at is the N input and this is simply asking how many parts we want in our aggregation. And let's say for now we want 120 parts. So the most recent version of WASP is relatively efficient and it should be computing relatively fast up to few thousand elements. Of course, that's also depending on uh, the complexity of your geometry as well as other parameters that we're going to go through in uh, other tutorials. We have our part, we have the number of connections, and the 
next element is, which is probably the most important part of WASP, is uh, rules. Rules are the way the little statement that define which part can connect with which part using which connection on the starting part and on the ending part. And uh, we are gonna see, in, I think probably in the next or next two tutorials, um, different ways to generate rules and how rules really are built. But for now, as we are going through the bare minimum, we can cheat a little bit and use a rule generator. A rule generator doesn't require us to uh, write any rule, but will generate um, all rules connect that are possible to be generated. And so we can connect our parts to it and then connect our rules to the component. The component is now already uh, functioning and if you look at it, it's already generating 120 parts, but we have to add one extra element and that's a button to reset the aggregation whenever we wanna regenerate a, a new configuration and not work with the one we already have. To do that, we just generate a button and we plug it in our reset. Great. We are pretty much done. Uh, and we see that uh, Wasp is already calculating, but uh, we don't see anything in the Grasshopper Canvas at the moment. The reason for that is that for the moment, Wasp classes do not have their own display method, but they are simply container that contain Rhino geometry. So if we want to display Rhino geometry, we have to extract it from the part itself. To do that, we can go to parts, get part geometry, bring it in and plug the part output to get part geometry. And there we go. We now see the wasp is calculating an aggregation and already generating it. In the background, wasp already takes care of avoiding any collision between the parts and making sure that the aggregation is consistent with the rules that we set with our ruler generator. We can now try to uh, increase the number and see that we start creating these very large clouds. Um, what we can do extra is we can also visualize this in a slightly more pleasing way. To do that, we can double click and bring a custom preview component, which allows us to view better. And we plug the output of geometry to uh, the geometry input of the component. We also right click on the part geometry and disable the preview. And lastly, we can choose uh, any color we might want to assign this. And to do that, we create a swatch. So we get a color swatch, we plug it here, and now everything goes white. But we can click on this color, little color square, and then choose any color we might like. So this allows us quickly to create everything we want. We can go back to the beginning, select everything and disable the preview. So not to have any overlapping geometry. And lastly, we can right click on perspective and choose a, a nicer preview that the ghosted you. So for example, you could choose Arctic mode. That is gonna give us a ray trace. And now we can uh, go back and we can start making a larger or smaller aggregation as well as if you don't like the aggregation that is getting computed for now, you can right click reset and it's gonna, every time you press it, generate a completely new aggregation starting from scratch. Now you can hide Rhino, position this in a location you like, and then you can start saving screenshots to share and to send. This is, it for this tutorial. This is like the very bare minimum you need to generate aggregations in WASP. I hope this was clear enough and uh, thank you for watching. If anything was not clear or you have any questions or any other requests for further videos in the series, uh, just let me know in the comment box. So thanks a lot and bye.